Welcome to the New Monastics Podcast, where we'll be discussing all aspects of the contemplative life and interspirituality in the context of modernity. On each episode, we will choose a topic to explore with one of today's leading teachers or thinkers. The New Monastics Podcast is a project of Caris Foundation for New Monasticism and Interspirituality, which is dedicated to the emergence of a newly conceived contemplative life of embodied spirituality and sacred activism. Welcome to the New Monastics Podcast. I'm Natanal, co-founder of Karis Foundation, and I'll be the dialogue partner for our guests. And I'm Daniel, the interviewer and host for the show. Today we have Amelia Hall, a scholar practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism, with interests in ecology and indigenous practices. Amelia completed her doctoral work at Oxford University and is currently a professor of religious studies at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. Welcome, Amelia. Thank you, Natana. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Well, why don't we begin with a little background? Um, let's talk a little about what it is to enter a tradition like Tibetan Buddhism when you come from a very different cultural milieu. Mm-hmm. So maybe tell us where you're from and how you came to be a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. <laughs> uh, how long is this podcast? <laughs> um, okay, so I I was born in the United Kingdom. I was born in the British Isles. I grew up in a quite a rural part of Britain in the southwest, and a really kind of sort of magical place. And I was always very interested in history, in spirituality, the arts, all of those kinds of things, and it wasn't really until later in my life, I think it was in my 20s, where I I was really interested in spirituality and ritual practice. I didn't really connect with the tradition that I grew up with, which was the Church of England. Not that I don't have respect for that, but it just wasn't something that really spoke to me very much. And I started to do my own wandering around the British Isles, visiting spiritual places, starting at old cathedrals, but then sort of going back in time and visiting very old places. And so I always felt this connection, but I didn't really ever know what to do with it. I wanted to know about magic and I wanted to have some kind of spiritual practice, but I couldn't find what I needed. But it was always there. It was always a part of me. And then I moved to the States and I ended up in Boulder and I got a job at a place called Naropa University. That was about almost 25 years ago now, which I think, Natalia, you were a student at the time. And I just suddenly started to really connect with the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism. There were a lot of Tibetan Buddhist teachers that were coming through Boulder at that time and were coming through Naropa University. And I also read a book by the founder of Naropa University, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, called Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. And I often think about my life before I read that book and my life after I read that book, because it really catalyzed something in me. And I also, I think, woke something up that made me become much more interested in the tradition of Buddhism, but specifically Tibetan Buddhism, because it felt, it appealed to me in a sense of sort of magic and a full system of thought and and instruction. And because I'm so interested in history and I love going deep with everything, I started to practice with a teacher. So my uh, main teacher was uh, Lama Tachin Rinpoche. He's a Tibetan teacher. He passed away a few years ago. I met him through a series of magical, strange events. And as soon as I met him, I knew that I just needed to learn from him. There was just a long connection there, a very deep lifetimes upon lifetimes of connections that I felt with this teacher. And I started to learn Tibetan Buddhist practices. And then I realized that I needed to learn Tibetan because I wanted to read them in Tibetan. And I wanted to learn everything I could about this tradition. And so that's why I started my master's and then my doctoral work at Oxford in the field of Tibetan and Himalayan studies. I wanted to learn the history. I wanted to learn the language. I just wanted to completely know everything. And that was actually my intention. I never really intended that. It wasn't my intention in the beginning to become a scholar, particularly. 
it was really about my practice. I really wanted to learn everything. But then I suddenly discovered that I actually loved being a scholar as well. And I went through some points where I think that scholar practitioner parts of me maybe were perhaps in conflict at certain times. But I think that's also a process. I think there's part of a process that happens there. And so it's been about 25 years of learning. And what's interesting to me is that I'm now at a point where I'm realizing that the thing that set me on this path, I'm circling back to. And so I'm circling back to with the blessings of this incredible tradition that I've been so fortunate to connect with and have such amazing teachers to teach me that some of the blessings that have come from that have allowed me to actually come back and take a look at where I'm from, the United Kingdom, the British Isles, the relationships and magic and spirituality of my childhood, and try to have uh, have those be both part of myself, but be both part of my spiritual life, but also my academic life. Is this the Lama Tarchan who was among the first Tibetan Buddhist teachers to come into the West? Or is it a, another Lama Tarchan? Um, so Lama Tarchan, no, he came, I, he came, I think, in the 1980s, but he visited Naropa University several times. He gave teachings here at Naropa, so you likely will have met him. But I, he didn't come in the in the early wave in the in the sixties. He came in the mid nineteen eighties to the United States. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm curious. We don't often talk about this, but I think it'd be interesting to people to hear. You know, many of us have taken on traditions that are not uh, traditionally rooted in the West, whether in the UK or here in the United States, mm-hmm. and sometimes we encounter elements of them that are are foreign to us or what was the most interesting thing about taking on this tradition uh, in terms of overcoming any any cultural oddities i think a big one is and i think this isn't this isn't limited to tibetan forms of buddhism but the teachings of the buddha dharma let's say is based on a concept, a sort of spatial and temporal concepts that are a circle and not linear. And so I realized that it took me quite a long time to notice or even be aware of the fact that I was approaching these teachings that are based on a circle and I was approaching them in a, in a, a linear way, like an arrow shooting at a target, right? And so I was missing so much because actually my mind culturally and socially conditioned in a very particular way to understand things in a, in a, in a linear process. And I'm learning things that is more like a stone being thrown in a pond and there's ever concentric circles that are informing one another. And so it's sort of like a, a surprisingly narrow view that I began with that through various ways, some painful, some hilarious, that that began to shift. So that's the sort of big level thing, you know? And then there's other, I mean, there's other things I think that I got very caught up in the cultural trappings of the tradition. And I think this is this is a common thing to happen, you know, wearing the clothes, having the implements and, you know, dressing up almost. Mm-hmm. And that that was somehow a signifier of me being serious. And actually that was not. And it was actually quite silly when I look back on it, but it's okay, you know, it's fine. (laughs) So there's there's sort of, you know, mundane things and then very deep things, I think, that that I noticed that I had to learn about. In terms of actual practice, I think that I had never been given a full – what I think of as a full system of magic that is ordered and has a complete trajectory and is, you know, this is something I'm talking about Tibetan Buddhism now. This is a whole system that has been nourished and cherished by the Tibetans for over a thousand years and protected. And it has a process to it. And so I don't have that from my own place. We have bits and pieces of things but we don't have, you know, the full volume set 
in the way that other traditions do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's interesting you you mentioned the the, the dressing up and yeah, I think like uh, especially with Tibetan Buddhism because I was a student at that same time that. Uh, that you were coming to Naropa to work there. Yeah. Uh, that was an observation of mine too, and something that I participated in also. And now on reflection, it's easy to see how that's a genuine interest and also a kind of immature interest, you know, a kind of cultural exotification of another tradition, and then to celebrate it because it's exotic. And yet that becomes the lead in for many of us into deeper things. But it does deserve questioning. And then, you know, another reason I asked the question, there's a wonderful novel by uh, Shusuko Endo called Silence, which is about uh, Jesuit missionaries coming into Japan. And they're, they're not caricatured as, uh, you know, the, the Jesuits that we see in many novels, you know, are coming in, you know, cultural and colonial oppressors. No, they're genuine. They're 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 trying to seed Christianity, and they believe it is the truth and and something beneficial, and mm-hmm. trying to serve a population that has already become Christian in Japan. Yeah. And one of the wonderful elements of the novel is this slow discovery that what they thought they were doing is not what is actually happening necessarily. Like the understanding of Christ they think they're giving (laughs) is falling into cultural norms within Japan and predispositions from the religion that is preexistent there. And so it begins to take that shape. And they're making the assumption that everyone is understanding Mm -hmm. and that translation is one to one. And and, and I think that's interesting how you framed it, that you, you were making assumptions about Tibetan Buddhism and approaching it in a certain way that come from our cultural mil- milieu yeah. and our superimpositions and may not be correct for how the tradition was, was uh, those that were bringing it over were desiring to bring it. And there's some sort of interaction there and tension in which we may get another version of Buddhism, or a slow inculcation of the Buddhism that was meant to be given. It's an interesting tension that I I think we don't often examine, but is uh, very current right now to talk about. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, the thing about, you know, the, the, the Buddha's Dharma is that wherever it goes, it kind of morphs and, and, and meets with whatever cultural context, you know, it did that in China, it did that in Japan, it did that in Tibet, and it's doing so in the United States, it's doing so in Brazil, it's doing so in Germany and Poland. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I find that sort of fascinating, you know, and that's why I have curiosity about how the sort of old ways and the knowledge and the indigenous knowledge of where I'm from meets with that. And, and some of what inspired my current research was going to Sameling in Dumfrieshire in Scotland, which was actually one of maybe the may have been the first Tibetan Buddhist temple and monastery in Europe. That's there in Scotland. And going there and walking up to the front gate and seeing off to the side there's a fairy hill. And the monastery had surrounded it with a fence, put a sign up saying, this is a fairy hill. Please don't smoke here. Don't pee. Don't do all these things. You know, this is a sacred place. They've put the traditional like prayer flags and um, stupa and make offerings there. And from their perspective, these are the local sadak. Because sadak are the territorial deities, right? The translates to something like the earth spirits, basically. And it really moved me because I was seeing actually a tradition, one that I had a deep reverence for and practiced within, acknowledging this relationships in my place where I'm from. And I found it deeply moving and really fascinating and interesting and was like, oh, like this can happen. And then I found out that from Sami Ling, there's a nun who goes to Loch Ness, which is 
reasonably close by and does uh, puja, Naga puja. So Nagas are like serpentine beings and dragons in the many Asian traditions that live in water. The Loch Ness Monster is a big Naga. Um, and they go and do these traditional offerings to the Loch Ness Monster. And I was like, well, of course. Like, I mean, it just makes sense to me that they would do that. And it was like, why would that surprise me? And then I started tracing, like they've actually placed all sorts of cairns and stupas in various places along the rivers where the local Nagas are. And they've created the traditional Scottish cairns because that's what fits in that landscape. And like, that's like, I love that. You know, I, I was like, I was seeing these two things that were so dear to me coming together and I'm just, I have so much curiosity about where that could lead, you know. And from the perspective of, you know, the Tibetans that founded that place, it's just common sense. You go and you identify the local beings in the landscape and you ask their permission and you develop a right relationship with them. You know, what you were just saying, it kind of leads into that is that the conversations and the dialogues and the relationships that that kind of relational quality is what I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. So I, of course, know that this is a, a personal interest of yours, and you've just mm. talked about it a little. But can you talk a little bit more about how that interest has unfolded over the years and where you are with it now and, mm -hmm. and how you're exploring? Yeah. So the research that I've been doing over the last few years examines... Um, human relations with non-human beings in Himalayan sacred places. So they're called ne in Tibetan. And ne is a really interesting word because it means all sorts of different things. It means a sacred place, but it also means to abide, to be. So I've been doing research in primarily the northeastern Himalayan region of Arunachal Pradesh. And there's a project that I'm part of and a community who I collaborate with looking at the relationships of particularly what are called the Lu in Tibetan. Um, in Sanskrit, it would be Naga. And these are snakes, dragons, various serpentine beings that are associated quite a lot with water and the purity of water. And I'm interested in these relationships and how it relates to sustainability in a way that I think has been mainly disregarded by Euro-American scholarship and conservation efforts. So there are rituals that are performed at particular times to these beings to really protect that relationship and protect the source of clean water and the environment. And that if these beings are upset and you disrupt their environment, they will cause disease, they can cause pandemics, they can cause earthquake, like all kinds of terrible climatic situations, illness, um, when that relationship isn't maintained properly in the proper way. And so my role really as a collaborator in this project, I think necessitated attending to issues of a disregarded cultural past in terms of interspecies relationships in my own place so that I could show up properly I didn't feel like I had the requisite expertise to talk to, to my colleagues in the Himalayas about their relationships with those beings until I actually had attended to what I felt was an impoverished relationship with those beings in my own place. And it doesn't mean that that's necessarily explicit in my research, but it's implicit in my view and lens that I'm bringing to my research. And when I come into a community and have conversations with people, I'm showing up with something intact or mended, let's say, because I feel that reflecting on the wisdom that's encoded within those types of relationships has for many centuries all across the globe contributed to keeping our planet's biodiversity stable and thriving. Those relationships with sacred natural sites and the other other than human beings that are associated because there's a sort of convergence right of ecological and spiritual practice so i want to acknowledge 
really that my way back to the places and wisdom of my own sacred places came from my experiences in the Himalayas, learning and observing and participating in practice and ritual regarding the Lu, so these territorial deities of a sacred landscape. And that's actually really a blessing. I consider that a blessing. So it meant that I'm looking closely at some of the underlying values of Western educational research and sort of taking steps to re-indigenize or rewild myself. You know, and it's interesting that I felt this quite strongly in Scotland. I read recently that Scotland may very well be the first European nation to rewild it, completely rewild itself. And so I think that this is really important work as somebody who is of European descent, that that work needs to be done, that we actually have to, I say we, I'm speaking now from the from my own location, is that I think there needs to be a process of re-indigenization or rewilding. And that's difficult work, but it's really necessary for many, many reasons. But this is something that's really behind as part of my methodology, whether or not it's totally explicit in everything I do. It's certainly very, very deeply embedded in my research. So that was quite a long-winded response, but... <laughs> When you're speaking, it, it seems so clear that latent within your comments is a inherent acceptance of the magical. Yes. You value the magical as valid or real. And yes. I'm wondering how that comes in with the balance of the scholar practitioner because Western academia almost loathes magic or has a <laughs> deep distrust of magic and the levels in which that practitioner awareness of a being like a naga is oftentimes discounted or assumed to be quote unquote not true and what does it mean to approach it from the assumption that it very well could be true or an, even farther than that an assumption that it is true because the tradition tells us these things over and over again mm -hmm. yeah i mean i would say when i started maybe 10 years ago or a little bit over 10 years ago to start really actually questioning the ways that I, I, I think I, you know, honestly felt I'd sort of been indoctrinated and that this sort of magical piece had been suppressed. And I realized that especially being in some of the places that I was at conferences, academic conferences, the, the communities that I was moving within that perhaps I might have been probably considered slightly odd in my approach to wanting to explore these things. And certainly there are times when I was, you know, not invited to speak at conferences or not, <laughs> you know, it wasn't popular, but it is actually becoming remarkably much more, there's a lot more interest in this. And so when I first started talking about these things in academic circles, it wasn't necessarily, I didn't feel like there was a lot of people on my side or who were getting what I was saying. And now I feel that there are much more. So I'm actually now being asked to talk a lot about this. And I think that with any kind of research or scholarly work, whatever you're doing, it's like you, you have to ask pertinent questions. And if you can ask the right questions and frame them in a way that everyone can understand and get behind, then you can um, actually further the field. And that's actually what, to me, scholarship is all about, furthering the field, you know. And so, for example, I may kind of change the way I talk about it in different circles. So if I'm in a very academic conference, I might discuss it in a different way than I do in a podcast like this, but I'm still asking the same question. So for example, I presented some work at an academic conference and I have research questions that I'm talking about methodology, what kind of questions are coming up in my work and certain ones that come up are, for example, are trees, glaciers, mountains, rivers, animals, and spirits considered stakeholders in climate change and environmental conservation studies in the Himalayas. 
what relational dimensions and or ontologies are involved, what practices and rituals are performed and by whom and what is the purpose or the result of these. And so it's not that I'm trying to convince everyone that leprechauns are real, but what I'm trying to say is that the relationships we have with these beings are really important on various levels. They're important on very pragmatic levels because, for example, where I grew up, there were places that were fairy trees. You didn't cut them down and there was a whole ritual aspect and spiritual understanding of why you didn't do that. But it was also a pragmatic response to keeping biodiversity to make sure that all the right animals and insects in these hedgerows that have been there for a thousand years all con contributed to actually the farmer's crops growing well and the harvest. And so I think if you start saying magic is this sparkly, amazing thing, to me, magic is every day. It's in every moment. You know, it's like my li life is always magical. So, and if it's not what certain academics want to hear, I mean, I'm never going to, no, nobody's ever going to say what every academic wants to hear. So it's not, I don't really mind. <laughs> if people don't agree with me, it's like, it's not, it's not really my, it, I, I, it's okay. And we can have discussions about it, but I'm not going to have that be suppressed anymore. Like I'm not, I'm not willing to actually ignore those relationships from my own place. If I'm going to go to somebody else's place and talk to them about their relationships, I'm not going to ignore the ones from my own place. It's just not polite apart from anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still, it brings up another question in the same vein, which is in as much as wearing the scholar hat, so to speak, one might describe a certain phenomenon in a certain way. And then from the practitioner view, describe the same phenomena in a different way or understand it in a different way. And then as a scholar practitioner, the question for me is, what's true? And is it the one view or the other view, or is there some kind of synthesis view? And I think this is also in the realm of inter-spirituality kind of, because it is interacting with traditions, both internally and externally like we now have the ability to step outside of the tradition and view it critically in a way that most traditional practitioners wouldn't necessarily have done for a lot of history what you're saying to me is what you know this is why i have such a deep respect for the tradition of of tibetan buddhism because and natalo natana will know recognize I'm about to say because he would have learned this when he was a student at Naropa, but they have this model of outer, inner, and secret. And it's such a beautiful model because and and it's it's not correct to to suggest that they're completely separate from one another. They intersect. But it's this really beautiful model of the the outer understanding of something, the inner understanding of something, and the secret understanding. And so you have the outer, I mean, that's sort of obvious. You have an outer understanding. The inner becomes a little bit more deep and, and psychological. And then you have a kind of cosmological understanding of things that can be ineffable and undescribable. And there's various ways in the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism that certain things are presented. And that would be dependent upon the recipient's propensities. And they all have value. Right, There's, that they're all th those things are instructional, inspirational, deeply, deeply contemplative, and they have effects on in different ways. But like that's that to me is such a beautiful model of how you might approach giving a teaching about something, how a teacher might introduce a topic to different people, and actually. In the work that I do in sacred landscape, when you read texts about sacred landscape, you can read about the outer, the inner, and the secret qualities of a sacred landscape. And depending on somebody's development in terms of spiritual practice, temperament, propensities, intuition, wisdom, 
they're able to access and see and be with and interact with and and abide within these different uh, levels. So a landscape itself has the outer qualities, but they're the inner and the secret qualities as well. And what and you know, sort of outer outer and outer inner. You know, there's all kind of like so. There's all these sort of intersecting ways. But I think that, for example, my experience with looking at a lot of scholarship on Tibetan sacred landscape, the approach in terms of when I, now when I'm talking about scholarship, I'm talking primarily Euro-American academic uh, scholarship has been on a very outer level. So it's described them as sort of places of refuge during times of war and pandemics. And when you start to look within the tradition, you start to see how there's this much deeper understanding. You look at pilgrimage guides and there's there's instructions for just your ordinary everyday pilgrim who wants to go and receive the blessings from the place. And then there's people who are doing deep practice and there's descriptions in these texts for how you actually practice because the land itself is set up as part of the, of the practice. So the actual features of the landscape are part of a visualization of practice that you actually do within it and it will enhance your practice. And on, on a very, very deep level, it's like, you know, the entire sensory field is can, you can liberate within. So I wouldn't necessarily talk about that level at an academic conference when I'm talking, but I might talk about that when I'm talking to scholar practitioners, or I might talk about that when I'm asked to talk to practitioners to say, when you go to this place, there's a practice is called sadhana. So sadhana practice involves all this visualization of a deity and becoming the deity. And actually the land itself, these, there are particular places that are a support for those practices. So if you've been initiated into those practices, you go there and you can see actually why you would do a particular practice in this place because the land itself is a support for your visualization. But if you're not initiated into that, then, you know, you wouldn't know that. And actually I've had conversations at, com- at conferences with scholars where they've questioned why I've translated something in a particular way. And I know they don't know because they're not a practitioner. They're a scholar, but they don't understand that the reason why I translated something in a particular way is because I know what practices are supposed to happen there and what the visualizations are. And I know immediately that this other scholar doesn't know that. And it's not, it's not, I'm not saying that as a criticism, it's just they're not a practitioner. And so they just wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to read that in the text because they don't have the reference. And so it's that's a inner and secret level that you can read. And that's something that is also fascinating to me as a translator of Tibetan uh, works because there are all these levels. It's like code, (laughs) you know? If you're enjoying the episode, please consider subscribing to our Patreon to help support the production of the podcast. Subscriptions begin at $1. All patrons receive access to bonus content, curated resources, and exclusive patron events, including live Q&As. For more information, please check out the Patreon link in the show notes, and thanks for listening. One of the best features of academic scholarship is that it relies on description. And, you know, that's good. Where it starts to get problematic is when it starts to make value judgments or talk about true or untrue. And then it's drifting away from its kind of basis into, you know, a kind of arrogance. But I think I'm somewhat formed in something of a pragmatist school, and, you know, which looks a lot at functionality. And when we look at traditions around supplicating spirits, of place and dealing with them and honoring their needs and their requests. There's, there's a relationality there that is very important and, and maybe irrelevant, you know, whether it's true or untrue. Because I'll give you a personal, for instance. So I, I'm Mexican American, and not long ago it was, you know, Dia de los Muertos, you know, the Day of the Dead. And there's a 
little outdoor altar to some of the people that we've lost in the community at Naropa on the campus. And I've slipped a picture of my grandparents in there. (laughs) And on the Day of the Dead, I had to teach classes. But in between classes, I went over there because I was aware I was not at home with my home altar. And so I had them there and I could talk to them. And I had an experience of being heard and responded to, you know, from, from, from the, the, you know, the, the photo of my, my grandparents. And now I can't, I can't, I would struggle for words to tell you what was said or what that meant or how I experienced it, other than I felt heard and responded to. And there was some sort of communication that I, as I experienced it. And so a lot of true or untrue, you know, questions would be about, well, how? And, and I don't know. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm still left with an experience, uh, which I cannot necessarily justify to you, but I can't deny to myself. One of the outcomes of that experience is, is that I relate differently to that place. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, that if somebody is, you know, supplicating the Nagas in a particular place or the spirits of a particular place, there's increased relationality. And we might just be in better or what we might say right relationship to place in ways that we've not been as a society. And so, you know, somebody could judge the belief as untrue, but the outcome is that we're in right relationship to the planet. And we're definitely not in right relationship to it now currently, largely because we have a utility mind with regard to it, an I-it relationship as opposed to an I-thou relationship. And so a person can judge the true or untrue and stop right there and miss the relationality, which is healthy for us. Exactly. I mean, that's exactly how I'm framing quite a lot of the work that I'm doing. It's like, I'm not trying to say they're real or not. And actually in the Tibetan tradition, they would say, actually, they're both real and not real. Like if you, if I, I remember there's some, te- I can't remember the teacher, but I remember this question that stuck with me and someone asked a Tibetan Lama about one of the deities and said, well, is Tara real, right? Is, is, uh, is this deity real? And the teacher said, she knows she's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's also this mindset because it's like in that tradition, it's like they're kind of real and not simultaneously. And actually that's not, like you said, it's sort of irrelevant, you know? And the thing that I I keep trying to come back to when I'm doing this work is to really point out that our present ecological crises presents challenges that we really need to learn how to address. And if we ask what it might mean to live and think differently, we might start to question these accustomed cultural assumptions, right, that render those beings and our connections with them and those relationships invisible or malign them or scorn them. So what I'm trying to do is revive what I think of as an impoverished terrain, right, an impoverishment. And so the relationality that you're talking about, I think, has much to offer as a response to environmental harm into those, these kind of interspecies relationships that allow for a really wide range of cultural and emotional and spiritual values to be expressed and acknowledged. And I think also you can start to see this happening, but I think it also expands the notion of what constitutes an environmental offense or who can be a victim of an environmental offense or violation and what restoration and you know conservation can look like. Because you know, there are places where there are cases of indigenous groups representing trees and rivers that have been harmed. And this is even happening in the United Kingdom. They're actually considering whether rivers can be considered entities in and of themselves, which have, you know, rights. And, you know, so this isn't for me just at some sort of personal pilgrimage to these places, it actually for me is really deeply about how we work towards reviving and and really healing something that's become so impoverished that we are in pretty grave danger, actually. 
And I think, again, that model of outer, inner and secret is a really good model. So there's outer ways, which is, you know, what can we actually do practically? So there are outer ways where we just mindfully inhabit and ceremonially inhabit our places, our land, you know, and maintenance of those kinds of relationships that are folded into local conservation efforts, for example, promotes environmental policies that actually also privilege the indigenous view that we should have been listening to. And I say we in terms of, you know, the uh, dominant European viewpoint that has ignored and degraded the indigenous view that kept us sustained for centuries upon century, that actually that needs to be privileged. And then there's inner ways of making offerings, just like you were talking about in the tunnel, you know, sacred altars, but even the land itself is a sacred altar, making those offerings. And there's all traditions actually have those kinds of ways of making those those offerings, you know, doesn't matter whether you're, you know, whatever your tradition is, you know, if you're Christian, this is God's creation, you know, treat this as God's creation. For me, it's, you know, I have my own ways of, of working with that. And then, you know, it can get much more kind of expansive and cosmological, but it can also be very natural, straightforward, simple. You know, I run a retreat where at the beginning of the retreat and we're relating the sacred landscape and I have everybody just sit and imagine a place that you had as a child, an outdoor place that you went to as a child. And it doesn't matter where you grew up. It could have been, you know, a local park or a forest or a desert or, but there was a place outside that was a place that you felt held by the earth. And like, that's a starting point right there to just have that as, as something that you come back to and really hold. And even that, I think, changes your perspective when you can realize that connection back. I think it's really important. So you can develop it with humility and care. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there are a lot of connected subjects here. I mean, we've been talking about uh, reconnecting to the earth and reclamation of, in, you know, indigenous heritage traditions that have been abandoned or lost. But I think these subjects are connected. And, you know, when we ask the question, how are we going to address our ecological crisis? Of course, there are answers that come from the perspective that helped create it. I think we need to be grateful for the line of evolutionary development that led to science in that perspective. But something perhaps not inherent but connected to it led to a utility-mindedness, seeing ourselves as the center and everything else as an object that we use and manipulate to, to some end. And you know, you know, as Einstein said, you know, you can't solve a problem on the level it was created. And, and sometimes we think that's going beyond, but it also seems fairly clear that we once had a consciousness that held us in good relation, right relationship. So, you know, when we look at those who drew on the walls of the Chauvet Caves or Lascaux, one thing that seems to characterize their consciousness is great relationality. That They believed the walls were speaking and hearing and everything. They were in relationship to all being. And that means that we relate with respect for all being. And we borrow and we ask permission of all those things with whom we hope we are in good relationship. And I think there's something important here about, you know, one of the outgrowths of that utility-mindedness is commodity culture. And the way commodity culture eats and replaces familial cultural, ancestral culture, relationship to place, commodity culture just eats all that. And that's part of what we're suffering from. And so, you know, addressing ecological crisis is also part of what needs to happen, is addressing the poverty of our relationship to our traditions, our family traditions, our ancestral traditions, locating ourselves in place, not only where we come from, but where we are now. There's a lot of reclamation work to do, and I think it's very legitimate. And it it will help 
I think, heal wounds that we have around social location, which are largely caused by a commodity mindedness. So uh, I know that you have even, you know, proposed a course for doing some similar sorts of work with European traditions. Maybe you could talk about how that's landed in your own life and how you've done some of that reclamation work, if you're willing. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've been working on a, developing a new course at Naropa to examine and present and explore the magic and spirituality of the British Isles and try to kind of untangle it from the patriarchal, imperialist, colonial context, like just try and actually understand how it got to this point where in between, so I'm, I'm going to just put myself into this as a European, say, how did I get to this point where bet- there's a sort of, there's all this monstrousness between myself and my ancestors and, and, and sacred knowledge and what you might call indigenous knowledge. But I, you know, I want to be very careful because I don't want to co-opt that word. So that's why I actually like rewilding because, you know, I've been following what's happening in Scotland, for example, that is really trying to rewild. And that's where a lot of my ancestors are from, or at least one side of my family. And so there's this definition of wild. What does that mean? I don't know if you know Gary Snyder's book, The Practice of the Wild, where he talks about how wild is often defined by what it is not. And he turns it around and and talks about wild as being naturally flourishing, self-propagating, flourishing in accord with innate qualities, spontaneous, naturally occurring. And in Tibetan, that word I would relate to what's called rung jung, which means basically naturally occurring or self-arising. And yet there's a lot of pain and difficulty and things that Europeans quite rightly should be guilty and ashamed of. But if you don't deal with that, there's nothing else you can do. And if you don't deal with that, then you're just going to start taking from other people. And I really want to work on this idea of ancestral repair and to, to show up. It's, I don't know. I may have said this to you before, Natano, but it's like to show up to the party with a bottle and a, and a bunch of flowers instead of empty handed, you know, and that like this kind of work, I'm thinking, okay, we might just show up like children with badly wrapped gifts at first, but it's a start. And I realized that I am lucky in the fact that I grew up in the place where my ancestors came from and that I have some connections there and I have some connections to the songs, to the dances, to the places, to the names of places, to the rhythm of the seasons and the things that you do and the kind of foods you eat, right? And I'm realizing when I came to the United States that a lot of people of, of European descent are completely cut off from it. They don't have any songs. They don't, have, they don't know what food to make. They don't have ceremony. And so they're just trying to find it. And so I had to kind of revive that in myself. And this is an offering to anybody that wants to explore that. But it means doing some hard work too. It means looking at the at the nasty stuff too and actually really going in and, and being honest. But I think it's important. We'll see if anyone signs up for the class. <laughs> but it's personal work that I've done. You know, I've gone and spent time in the different seasons and places. Um, you know, I've gone and spent like a very dark, cold winter nights in long barrows and, you know, <laughs> just gone to these places to really make that connection. And I think that it's something that needs to be done, particularly imperative for our brothers and sisters who've been suffering from uh, us not being willing to do this work. And so, you know, that's my inspiration for it. And um, I have all sorts of other ideas that we can go on pilgrimages and make it big but it's starting off small we'll see what happens <laughs> i don't i don't think it's a matter of whether anybody will show up it was it's a matter of whether whether any of the rest of us will have anybody sign up for our classes anymore 
because you, you know quite well the, the the demand is for such things and we're being asked where are these traditions how can we know them why don't we have classes on this or why don't we have classes on magic and and that demand is getting stronger and stronger i was just in a bookstore the other day and it's a bookstore i visited you know for 25 years and i've watched the shelf space change in this bookstore and what used to occupy those shelves and where they used to be you know, it would go from Buddhism to Taoism, you know, to Christianity, Judaism, Islam, and that would cover the, the whole set of shelves. On that far end now, the whole third shelf, there were th of three, is now all magic. And whereas that was a tiny subsection on the bottom shelf, you know, 20 years ago. And so, the question is, how are we going to respond to the need? And the need is somewhat inarticulate. People don't necessarily know exactly what they want or want from this. But that's how that thonic element that comes out of the earth tends to express itself. It's just this little shifting and desire. And, and we need to respond to it yes. because that's yeah. the planet itself asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's, it's, and I no, I've noticed it too. And you know, this response was really from so many students saying, we want to learn more, but, you know, we really want to learn this. We really want this. And we do have to respond. And I feel like anything that I can offer in terms of coming from the place where I grew up with tradition, you know, I mean, you talk about your experience um, recently on the Day of the Dead Every Hallow's Eve, there's certain foods that I make. I make a shrine. I make an offering to my father. There's certain songs that I would sing, you know. And I know the I know the roots of trick or treating, for example. There's a whole long history behind that, and I feel like that would be interesting for certainly our students at Naropa to actually learn. Where does that come from? It's not just some made up thing. It's, it has it has deep, deep roots. And it had a lot of different kind of meaning and a lot of things got mixed up together. And so I think that, again, it's not a system in the same way as, as I was saying at the beginning of what we were saying, at uh, uh, beginning of this podcast where I was saying that, you know, the Tibetans have a full system that's been preserved and cherished and nourished and built upon. We don't have that, but we do, there is, it's back there. Right. It is it is back there and it's needed. The earth needs it. The planet needs it. Um, and as hu and humanity, I think, really needs it. So this is just my little seed, you know, that I'm planting. Yeah, it seems like a lot of what's important around the magic is the orientation towards it and the purpose with what we're doing it. I feel like a lot of the magical things that are coming up especially in like pop culture are very individualistically focused like performing magic to acquire something for myself whereas i think an important element is what you're speaking to of a fully fledged tradition that holds these magical practices in a larger context whether that's for liberation collectively or healing of the planet or stewardship and it feels like why we're doing magical practices is just as important as what magical practices we're doing. But in this vein, I have to confess that the previous answer around if it's true or not is not fully satisfying for this reason, because I understand the pragmatic approach of even if it's quote unquote not true, maybe we develop a relationship that has beneficial outcomes in one way or another, but it still feels consequential whether when we're feeding the Nagas, the Nagas are eating it, or that's almost something psychological that we're doing with ourselves. And I understand that there's not an easy answer, and I appreciate the traditional view of real and not real that's helpful to hold, you know, but that's where some of this interest lies, at least for me, is if X, Y, or Z being or dimension is quote unquote real and available to interact with, 
that seems important for what we do and how we do it. You know, and it's worth saying that true or untrue is for the person that wants to make that judgment. Oh, that's not true, or, or it is true. What I was trying to say is, nevertheless, it was profoundly personal. Uh, I may struggle with true or untrue. And nevertheless, it was profoundly personal and meaningful. And, and that's something that's uh, beyond the category of true and untrue. But I think it's hard to deny that the relationality becomes important for healing. <laughs> you know, if, if you have to make an argument to somebody about the why of it. I mean, if you think, of, I think about this, you know, when something has a, a kind of reality to it, whatever the mind has created has some kind of reality to it. And what we're actually experiencing is also our own projections. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine who had fairly severe mental illness and had hallucinations. And we would have these conversations where they would say to me, you know, there was a spider in the hallway and I had this whole conversation. And, you know, I know that that's not true. And I was like, yeah, but actually, no, it was like that moment was actually, you were experiencing that moment, you had that conversation. And so there was a reality to that experience. And for somebody to tell you that that's not real, is not actually helpful in that moment at all. You know, and it's like, maybe there was something that that spider needed to tell you, maybe there was some important thing, you know, and, and it's sort of like, to me, again, there's a kind of irrelevance in a certain way, because again, I'm a Buddhist. So everything to me, it's like, everything is kind of, you know, kind of illusory. Right. And so I'm experiencing reality based upon all sorts of interactions that are mental and material that are producing perceptions that then I believe to be my reality, but that's idiosyncratic. <laughs> so, yeah, but for, you know what I mean? But there's still a difference between interacting with, let's say a doll <laughs> and a dog. Like the dog is a living being and can interact with me in a different way than the doll. A doll is more, I'm interacting with myself through the medium of the object. Right. But somebody, another being could be having a different relationship with the doll and the dog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Jung had a very helpful category for this. <laughs> you know, the dialogue with the spider was a fact of her experience or their experience, mm -hmm. a fact of their experience, you know, and, and we're so much talking about facts in terms of objective reality, whatever that is, if it ever existed. Right. But it's it's helpful to have this category. We have facts of our experience. And we don't necessarily know what to do with them, but we also are fairly certain we had them. <laughs> and they're informing our responses, right? It's informing how we respond and how we react. Exactly. And they need more room in our consciousness, more validation. You might say, oh, I didn't hear that, or I didn't witness the dialogue with the spider. <laughs> so it was not a fact of my experience, but I can't deny it was a fact of your experience. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I appreciate it. I think y'all are just both too, <laughs> I think y'all are just both more mature practitioners than I am. So I, my mind is still just like wanting to grasp and question, you know, but it's also, I'm, I'm unconsciously, you know, trying to wear that hat in terms of like, Yes, I hear y'all and what you're saying is really valuable perspective. And just being honest, it doesn't resolve the question for me. Like there's still that curiosity, like what is true here? What's real here? But I don't know if that's really ever going to get resolved. Oh yeah, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not looking I, I, for it. <laughs> I'm not looking for the resolution. I'm, I'm more interested in the question than the answer. But the question being juicy is maybe <laughs> worth something. But just thank you so much, Amelia. It's been so lovely to have you on and yeah. just coming to a close here. I'm wondering if you have a poem or prayer or anything that you would like to read and share to lead us off. I do. Um, there's a, a figure from the Tibetan tradition called Jamgong Kongtrul. He's a, I describe him as a, 
19th century Tibetan wizard scholar and polymath. And um, he has, uh, there's a, a beautiful translation of something he wrote, which is all about pilgrimage to sacred holy places in the Himalayas. And I'm just going to read you a verse, one verse. There's a poem, a sort of verse that's in this about sacred landscape and actually what I was talking about in terms of the outer, the inner, and the secret view. So this is from Jamgang Kongcho. To those of aberrant minds, this place is just earth, stone, water, and trees. To mistaken intellects, it appears as solid, inanimate objects. To practitioners, appearances have no intrinsic nature. To those of pure vision, it is a celestial palace full of deities. To those with realization, it is the radiant luminosity of innate awareness. Mm, thank you. I feel like that. I feel like my questions resolved now. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you, Jamun Thank you, Control, I thank, you. It. thank you, Jamun Control, and Pate. Yeah. <laughs> Should we bow out? Yes. Yes. Shout out to friend of the show, Tree Fort of Golden Turtle Sound, for producing the intro and outro music and assisting with mixing and mastering. Be sure to check out his awesome music and hit up Golden Turtle Sound for any of your audio engineering needs.